Unsere Ausstellung heißt Rembrandts Orient. Heutzutage ist der Begriff Orient etwas problematisch, weil er durch die Zeit des Kolonialismus etwas diskreditiert ist. Aber es ist nicht unser Orient, sondern es ist der Orient, den Rembrandt gesehen hat. Und wir schauen sozusagen durch Rembrandts Augen ähm, auf das, was er gemalt hat. The interest in Asia and the exotic world all goes back to the opening up of Asia uh, for commerce. So there is in one word enormous global expansion. Merchants went to uh, the Middle East and further. They brought back all sorts of objects, textiles, um, porcelain. They made uh, profits uh, very well. And this means an overall change in the artistic attitude of the Dutch Republic towards the outside world. Rembrandt was really born in the right place in the right time. He first met people from the Orient. He met delegates from diplomatic missions coming from Persia. Von den vielen, vielen Malern, die ihre Personen bei Historienstücken, bei Bibeldarstellungen im 17. Jahrhundert mit orientalischen Kleidungen ausgestattet haben, ist Rembrandt eigentlich der bedeutendste, der es am sorgfältigsten gemacht hat und der dafür steht, dass dieser Orient oder diese Orientvorstellung in die niederländische Bildwelt eingedrungen ist. But if we talk about Rembrandt's Orient, uh, then I would prefer to talk about uh, Mughal India, Safavid Persia uh, and the Ottoman Empire. Im 17. Jahrhundert, das war das Jahrhundert, in dem Rembrandt lebte, waren die nördlichen Niederlande, war Amsterdam das Zentrum des Welthandels. One of the great achievements of the Netherlands was to open up trade to India, Indonesia, China, Japan, Sri Lanka on a huge scale. That was an enormous expansion and a very, very um, commercial success. The Netherlands became the emporium for importing and reselling uh, spices, uh, cloth, silver, uh, silk from the East throughout Europe. Sie haben 1602 eine äh, Gesellschaft gegründet, die Vereinigte Ostindische Kompanie hieß das und das war eine Aktiengesellschaft, eine Monopolgesellschaft und äh, die bestimmte also sehr schnell den Handel. In 1612 the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire granted a set of um, privileges to the Dutch Republic. Und das führte dazu, dass innerhalb weniger Jahre ein, ein immenser Zustrom an Waren äh, nach äh, Amsterdam kam. It was a boom city already in the beginning of the 17th century and it grew more and more prosperous during the century. Uh, there were always ships uh, with sailors coming back with parrots uh, and with uh, exotic items uh, that um, really fascinated Europeans. If you look at cityscapes of Dam Square in Amsterdam um, by someone like Gerrit Bergheide, you're bound to see groups of Orientals out there. So this sort of reflects the cosmopolitan feeling that Amsterdam had at, uh, at the time. Together with the enormous richness, there was an enormous demand for paintings. Art was a booming field. Uh, by the middle of the 17th century, one in three artists working all over Europe was either from the northern or the southern Netherlands. Es hatte nie so viele Maler vorher oder nachher wie im 17. Jahrhundert in den nördlichen Niederlanden gegeben. They were all making a living and uh, Rembrandt was able to take advantage of this market, this, this vast market. Amsterdam war das Zentrum, aber es gab auch andere Städte, Haarlem, Leiden, Dordrecht. Ähm, das waren große äh, auch Handelsstädte, äh, in denen sehr viel Geld war und wo viele Maler lebten. There were so many painters working in those cities that there was also a big competition between the painters. That meant that they had to specialize. Jetzt fing man an, 
Fischstillleben zu machen, Bücherstillleben, Blumenstillleben. Diese Stillleben, das war ein ganz wichtiges neues Genre. Dann aber auch Seefahrtsbilder, also Marinedarstellungen, da kam der Reichtum her. Aber es gab dann auch viele Bürger, die sich in ihrem Haus haben porträtieren lassen, mit ihrer Familie, in ihrer Umgebung und damit dann auch zeigen konnten, dass sie recht viel Geld hatten. Out of that grew the well, well-known Dutch school of the golden age. Rembrandt was able to make use of the rise of his country uh, in order to uh, rise to the top of the European art world. He could start off doing his thing and seeing how things went. Well, they went very, very well. There are some examples of Dutch painters going to the East, and especially to Persia. Just on their own, which was an enormous risk. They didn't speak, they didn't know the way exactly, they didn't speak the languages, but nevertheless they were so interested in the other cultures that they went there, made sketches, came back and worked them out. And there are about well, that's four or five of them became court painters at the court of uh, the Persian Shah. So they had, a, they had a rather high position at the court also. And it was not only that, for the first time in history, um, envoys from the Dutch Republic could establish themselves inside the Ottoman Empire. This gave Dutch scholars an opportunity to go to the Middle East themselves and study local culture and, more importantly, to buy manuscripts, to have access to original handwritten texts on all sorts of subjects from the Ottoman world. And Rembrandt said, I don't have to travel. It's a big pain in the neck traveling. I can stay here and all the art I need to know comes my way. Rembrandt was fascinated by the dress, the turbans, uh, the long clothes. He also was able to uh, see how his friend and a partner in art, Jan Lievens, painted uh, uh, gorgeous oriental figures. And they played around with these motifs and sort of remade them into a fashionable idea of what orientals look like. So it's not necessarily very realistic. You can see it um, mostly in paintings with uh, scenes from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those stories, they play in the Near East. So the painters had to invent oriental persons. They had to fantasize a little bit. He was paying studio models he was putting turbans on them, giving them Eastern-looking clasps on their, their cloaks, uh, and selling them as paintings of Eastern princes. These turbaned men that we find in uh, some of Rembrandt's paintings, these turbans are very too big. It's a way of exaggerating something that definitely does exist, but he sort of twists them into his own molding. And for Rembrandt and his followers, that would have been the bigger the better. Rembrandt was a collector, he was well off at an early stage and he bought knickknacks and weapons and clothing from the East. So he had a lot of oriental stuff in his own possession. Der plötzliche Überfluss an Waren, dieser Reichtum an Gütern hat die Zeitgenossen in Amsterdam völlig verblüfft. Sie kauften einfach Dinge, die sie nicht zum Leben brauchten, die aber Spaß machten, die luxuriös waren, die schön waren. Und so begannen diese ähm, ostasiatischen Güter mehr und mehr äh, in die Haushalte der Niederländer einzugehen. It was prestige to some extent to have all this stuff from from all around the globe. Diese asiatischen Objekte, Raritäten, ähm, hatten eine vielfache Bedeutung, weil sie ihren Besitzer auswiesen als wohlhabend, als jemand, der sich das leisten konnte und jemand, der ganz aktuell mit der Zeit geht, weil er jetzt diese neu verfügbaren Waren hat. Und ähm, sie wiesen ihn auch als Kenner und auch als Connoisseur, als, als Liebhaber äh, dieser Schätze aus und, und auch als Liebhaber der Kunst dadurch. But I suspect that Rembrandt also uh, simply liked them for their own sake. He wanted to collect them because they were slightly offbeat, slightly weird, and, and he, he took to that. 
mit den äh, kostbaren Muscheln und mit Dosen aus Indien und äh, Kleidungsstücken und Löwenfällen und ein Paradiesvogel und all diese Sachen hat er gehabt. He collected them for their weirdness, for their colorfulness. And the sad thing is that he had to sell them all because he went bankrupt. So in the end he had uh, nothing left. Well, I'm not sure if you could call it exchange, but there was a certain one-sided influence. Art became one of the elements in the rich trade uh, that went through the Netherlands and reached the other countries. Especially in the second half of the 17th century, hundreds and hundreds of Mughal or Indian miniatures were exported to the Netherlands and they were collected here by the owners of the cabinets of curiosities, the Rariteiten cabinet. And they were quite popular and we think that they were especially popular because of the fact that they told something about the history of India, of gave some ethnographical information. People here locally in the Dutch Republic were very much impressed with those. But they were not so much valued for their artistic quality. Except for two painters, there are two Dutch painters who in fact did copy and, and did use these miniatures as inspiration for their own works. And one of them is Rembrandt. He made about 20 copies of Mughal miniatures, drawings, um, somewhere in the 1650s. Um, and the other one is Willem Schellings. And Willem Schellings uh, used these miniatures as sources for oil paintings. In an overall context, the Dutch Republic responded to the opening up of the Asian trade. And if you talk about Dutch art, going there, uh, you mainly talk about prints that travel to the east. And, and we are talking about tens or hundreds of artists. It all goes back, it's a bit difficult to explain, but it all goes back much further than the 17th century. Um, in the first half of the 16th century, both the Habsburg Empire and France sent their embassies to uh, to, the, to Constantinople, to Istanbul, to conclude treaties with the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and in their retinue they brought draftsmen, artists and also scholars, the first scholars who studied the Arabic language and Islam and so forth. The draftsmen came back with uh, drawings of local people in their own traditional costume. Uh, splendid, absolutely wonderful textiles, wonderful uh, fashion. Um, and they brought these drawings back and these were converted into prints and these prints ended up in costume books as we call them, uh, which were printed all over Europe, well, but especially in the southern Netherlands as we call them, which is now Belgium. A lot of these albums were printed in Antwerp. And many of these albums with these costumes of exotic Turks, as we ever call them, um, ended up in the collection of uh, Rembrandt himself. Rembrandt was really special. He, he was so versatile, he could do everything. He was one of hundreds of artists working in the country at the time, but he immediately made an impression. He was capable of working on all the kinds of art that were done at the time. He made still lifes, he made landscapes, he did portraits, he did biblical paintings, mythologies, and he did it all with a really deep knowledge of artistic tradition, also of sources in literature and in the Bible, uh, and with knowledge of what was happening in Germany, in Italy, in France, by way of artistic innovation. Rembrandt liked to show off. He liked to um, have lots of gold in his picture because gold is shining. Even in regular portraits, if you went in for a portrait by Rembrandt, he would turn you into someone that would be a, a showstopper if uh, you came across them in, in real life. So Rembrandt really was an international celebrity as an artist in his own time. Everyone was looking at Rembrandt for the use that he was able to make uh, of all of this wealth and all of these exotic values.